become dear friend of Pitango, uh, Mr. Stanley Bergman, Chairman and CEO of Henry Schein. This is our first uh, session of Pitango No Filter Health Tech Series and part of a, a much broader uh, No Filter Series that, that we're conducting over here in Pitango. Um, I'm uh, Guy Zekiel. I'm a managing partner at Pitango. Uh, Pitango is a, is a platform, a venture capital firm, a leading venture capital firm over here in Israel under management of uh, $2.5 billion and we're structured into three groups. One is a gross venture capital fund, which is investing in late stage companies. A second one is a, a tech early stage venture capital fund. And a third one is our health tech fund, uh, which I managed together with uh, my partner, Retire L, my apparel and the rest of the Pitango team. Um, so uh, with that, uh, again, very excited to host uh, Stanley Bergman today. As many of you know, Henry Schein is a Fortune 500 company and the world's largest provider of healthcare products and services to office-based dental and medical practitioners with his presence in 32 countries. In 2019, the company's sales reached $10 billion from continuing operations. Henry Schein has been a Fortune world most admired company for 17 years. It's also been extremely innovative and acquisitive. Since 1989, Henry Schein has purchased more than 200 companies. So again, Stanley, it, it's really great to have you on board. And you know, when I read and went through the history of Henry Schein, it was so interesting to see how well it's entangled together with your personal history. So maybe if you don't mind, Stanley, maybe you could start off with telling us a little bit more about the history of Henry Schein and your personal history. Sure, Guy. Good morning, uh, New York time. Good afternoon, Israel time and in between. I'm very pleased to be here with you today. Of course, I've known Kemi from uh, the World Economic Forum for many, many years and Aharon uh, Mankowski uh, through the Israel India Business Forum. And we've worked together for a long time. I, of course, know your firm quite well. We do business with you, uh, with some of your portfolio companies. And as I said to you guys early on, we'd love to do business with more of your companies. Give us the products, we'll sell the products. So uh, Henry Schein uh, is focused on the office-based healthcare practitioner. That's dentists and physicians outside of the acute care setting, although we do sell to some hospitals. And today, of course, uh, hospitals do own office-based practitioner uh, practices and we sell to those. Um, what we really focus on is providing the entire spectrum of products, consumables, uh, equipment, pharmaceuticals that an office-based practitioner may need. So go into a dental office, sit in a chair or go visit a physician and anything they need in their practice, we will provide. In addition to that, our success is primarily based on the notion that we help office-based practitioners operate a more efficient business so that they can focus on better clinical care. And that connection, we are a significant player in the software field. Yes, the practice management software, but more important, the electronic medical record and the intraoperability of that record with a series of devices. And in that connection, we also have all sorts of programs that deal with the man generation of patients, um, reputation management, so including website uh, development and monitoring. And we also, in a number of areas, manufacture our own products, not general products, but specialty products, implants, orthodontics, uh, endodontics, and bone regeneration products. These are specialty products that we feel we have to be deeper into the supply chain the rest of the product offering, we essentially work with about 4,000 suppliers around the world. And uh, the business is focused through four business units. Our global dental distribution business, which is about half the business, the biggest, a little bit less than half. Our dental uh, specialty businesses, uh, and then our oral surgery business. And we also have in the United States, and to some extent in Europe, a business that focuses on office-based physicians. Uh, and these businesses have done relatively well. So uh, at the end of the day, about uh, uh, half of our businesses, over half of our businesses in the United States, 
and the rest is spread between Canada and the rest of the world with a growing business in uh, Asia as well. Great, incredible. And, and, and Stanley, you know, I think, uh, and we'll, we're going to talk about leadership uh, later on in the session, but I do have to ask you right up front, you've been in, in, in this organization for 40 years, you've been CEO of Henry Schein for 30 years, which I think is, is remarkable for, for a Fortune 500 company. Um, you know, us Israelis and, you know, specifically the Y generation, we, you know, we're used to jumping from one position to another position every three years. And I do have to ask you, you know, right up front, what keeps you engaged and motivated? What, what inspires you about what you do and about what Henry Schein does? Well, Guy, I really think that the success of business is all about people. And I love working with the people that are involved in Henry Schein. Um, many of the senior team, I would say the majority of the senior team, have been with the company 20 plus years. My original partner, still with the company, we've been partners for 44 years. So it's all about people, I think. It's about engagement with people. And I think people excite everyone, each other. I find uh, every day when I open my emails in the morning, I'm getting emails from different members of the team, we call it Team Shine around the world. Everyone inspires me to move on. And so it's about uh, engagement with the team. And the Henry Shine concept, by the way, is one of stakeholder capitalism. We've been involved with this for ever since really Henry and Esther opened the door and involves partnering with our suppliers. We want our suppliers to say, Henry Shine is the best place to bring my products to market. Our customers, we want them to say, you know, I need Henry Shine to run my practice. The team, a significant engagement with the team. We can talk about that a little later. And our investors, we're very clear with our investors that our investors are an important constituent, but they're one of five constituents. And uh, if we take care of all other four constituents, we will define, and investors will define in the long time, long term, we will create shareholder value. And then the fifth constituency is an engagement with society. The professions we serve, the communities we're in, and the world in general. And these five constituents making up the Henry Schein mosaic of success is what motivates me every day. Excellent, good. So Stanley, if we go back to the Henry Schein model and you know, it has evolved over the, the, the last you know, 40 years. You know, I'm, I'm very curious to understand uh, you know, why would a big manufacturer like you know, 3M, GE um, in the US prefer to work through Henry Schein as opposed to developing its own sales force? You know, we, when we develop companies, you know, the small startup companies over here in Israel, usually they, they reach out to the big manufacturers and, and you are so well positioned between the manufacturer and the provider. Um, so curious to understand more about this model. Well, uh, bottom line is we have to help the suppliers, which is our first constituent, gain market share for the existing products and of course help them introduce new products. And essentially we do this through what we call a hybrid sales model. We have a significant amount of data on dentists and office-based practitioners. We've had this way before AI or database management ideas became important. We've always had data. Uh, 60 years ago, it was on cards. And so we know who buys what in the practice, who's likely to be interested in a particular product, and how we can help that manufacturer advance the sales of their products with a particular practice. At the end of the day, the products that we sell, of course, have to have a good quality, have to be regulatory compliant, have to have reimbursement, all that kind of stuff, but have to help the practitioner operate a more efficient practice and provide better clinical care. Our expertise is in communicating that message through various channels. Of course, initially it was the mail, then the telephone, then uh, e-commerce, now, of course, social media. But the big way we do it is we have about two and a half thousand, actually closer to 3,000, what we call field sales consultants. These are people that go into the practice and help with consulting services. And as part of that message, they of course are representing their products. No different to a full service uh, asset manager who's going to a family and saying, I will help you manage your financial affairs. I'll have all the services you need and I'll help you put a portfolio together. So in the COVID period, 
we were the first phone number for many, many dentists. We had to power down their practice, power it up ra rapidly, figure out how to stay in touch with their patients, get the funding, and of course deal with the PPE and all the related equipment that had to be brought in pretty quickly and the reconfiguration of the office. It's that value added service that we provide that is the stickiness between us and our customers that suppliers really find important in advancing the sale of their products. So for example, I don't know, the world's largest provider of dental products is Colgate. We are the exclusive distributor to dentists in the United States for Colgate. Colgate has, I would imagine, I don't want to insult anyone out there, but probably the finest marketing operation in, in dentistry, if not the finest, one of the finest. They have a great sales force that work with our sales force, but we can put their products in front of the practitioner in a way that makes sense to the practitioner and to Colgate. Interesting. So, 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 so just to, to go back to, to that example, so Colgate is developing the marketing materials. You guys are responsible for the sales channel and you work together as an integrated team. With, correct, with their salespeople. Understood. So our job is to get the Colgate salesperson in front of the decision maker in the practice. Now the decision maker in the practice is different depending on the practice. We know who that decision maker is for every product and we will make sure that the Colgate salesperson in the 10 minutes they have with the practitioner knows how to get their message across. That's what we do. Right. So if I'm, I'm a small company, a startup company from Israel, I've developed a, a groundbreaking product and I want to now try and, and reach the, the practitioner in the United States, um, you know, small practices in the United States. What's the advantages of working you know, through Henry Schein as opposed to developing my own sales channel? Yes. Uh, first of all, just to be clear, it's not only the United States, we're throughout the world. And uh, the way in which we operate is similar, but somewhat different depending on the country. Now, the first example I gave you was Colgate. This is a pretty sophisticated company, uh, huge sales and significant resources, both in R&D and in marketing, getting the message and a well-heeled sales force. Now, if you're talking about a brand new company that has a good product uh, and a good idea, I would start at the beginning. Uh, I would suggest that we have an innovation group uh, that looks at these kinds of products and ideas and determines whether it's a product we actually can make a difference because there are certain products where it's unlikely that we can actually create a market position for, but there are other products that we can. And we will then work with that company to ensure that the company thinks through the regulatory. We're not regulatory experts, but we know how to get to regulatory people. And we'll help them think through reimbursement. Key, one of the biggest challenges I found in the earlier days with Israeli uh, venture and PE firms is they focused on the product and they brought a good product to market quickly, but they forgot that in certain instances, reimbursement is needed. So that needs to be dealt with up front. We are not reimbursement experts, but we know how to get it done and we'll help. Uh, once that's done, we now have to think of how to bring the product to market. And remember our 3000 field sales consultants, we have another 2000 on the telephone are representing many manufacturers. So what is important is that private equity firm back business or uh, a venture back business will have to develop its own sales force that will work with our sales force. Remember our sales force is as much the customer as the dentist or the physician. So we have to help put that together. It's not good enough to say to Henry Schein, here is a product. We need much more than that. We need to work on bringing that product to market from a marketing, market positioning point of view. We do have companies within the Henry Scheid portfolio that do that, but they're not in every area. And we'd have to either determine whether you want to use one of the Henry Schein companies that would figure out how to bring the product to market and sell it direct or through Henry Schein's distribution business, or the company will have to set up their own operation to work with our distribution business. But we, I think, have done a good job with many, many small businesses. In fact, I would say most of our innovative successes have come from relatively small businesses. And in fact, Guy, when we go into a new market or we go into a new area, we usually do it in partnership with entrepreneurs 
uh, many of them are PE backed. Interesting. So, so you touched upon reimbursement and obviously regulatory approval. So I'm, I'm curious if, if I'm a small startup company again, and I want to enter um, and, 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 and team up with Henry Schein, what is your expectations in terms of, uh, uh, of product uh, um, acceptance or readiness, I would say? Do you expect yes. me to do a pilot study first and come to you with some, some market data before uh, signing up for that? How would you launch this yeah. limited commercial launch? How would you expect us to, to roll this out? You know, Guy, you've hit the nail on the head. When you do your business plan with an entrepreneur that has an idea, Developing the product, true, important. Manufacturing, they can either do it themselves or you can find a source to do that. But put aside money for actually doing the right studies to determine the validity of the product and how to actually, and who the audience is for that product. And then to develop the marketing peer material, working with KOLs, key opinion leaders. All of that is required. It's not good enough to, to have a product. We have seen many, many great products just fail because the latter part hasn't been done and because money was not set aside to, to do the analysis on who's gonna buy the product, how should it be positioned, how should it be packaged. And packaging, remember, dentists in particular and some physicians are consumers. They're sitting in their chair and they're looking at that package all the time. It's gotta be done right. You've, you've gotta set up the right vehicle to bring a product to market. We can help, but, and we have some businesses that will do it, but not in our entire spectrum of the 200,000 products we sell. Uh, but you need to figure all that out up front and we will help. And the big one is reimbursement. Many products have, great products have failed because there's no reimbursement. I can think, and I don't want to talk about now, but, uh, two great Israeli products uh, that have not worked out because they never thought about the reimbursement. So, Stanley, you touched upon the 200,000 various products you have, and obviously it, it seems like you have a very diversified product portfolio. Could you talk a little bit about the synergies between the, the various products that, that you have? Yes, that's a good question. So it's about 200,000 products that we offer. Um, actually, if you add the products that we'll order on your behalf, it's even greater. And uh, they come from just under 4,000 suppliers. When you cut through it all, though, there's about 150, you know, 80 20 rule in extreme, 150 suppliers that account for a huge amount of our business. So that's one set. We work with them, and generally, we work on themes um, gynecologists, endodontists, orthodontists, uh, dermatology is a big part of our business. And then there's the GPs, and a big part of that, of course, is uh, vaccines. But uh, we work along themes and we mix and match suppliers to advance a particular specialty or particular theme. So that's one set. And then we have our own businesses, the orthodontics, endodontics, implants, software. Uh, these are self-contained businesses. But the goal is to advance synergies between the businesses that where we represent a wide variety of products as a distributor, Henry Schein Dental or Henry Schein Medical. And we'll have themes around that by specialty. And then the businesses that Henry Schein is active in and owns uh, or has an interest in that are more specialty businesses. And creating the synergies, we call that one shine, is a key strategy. Not always to, easy to get done because many of our businesses that we've invested in, we don't own 100%. We own an interest. The distribution business is 100% owned with different P&Ls. At the parent company level, we would just want to grow the business and we'll worry about profits later. But when you get managers that are running P&L and incentivized based on their P&L, sometimes there are challenges. But this is our job. And our job is also to make sure, and we have core competency, just like you do, in working with entrepreneurs. That's a specialty com uh, competence. <laughs> so, so, you know, interesting, and I'm going back to, to my, my history. I was managing a company which was in the hard valve business. It was a Pitango company. Uh, I was CEO of that company, and we were going through clinical trials, and, you know, we were already starting to think about 
you know, the day in which we'll, we'll sell the product. And we were contemplating if to sell and develop our own sales force in the United States. Obviously, this is, you know, one of the biggest and most important markets. Or we had a strategic relationship with Metronic. Metronic was an investor in our company or go through Metronic. And the concern was when we would go, if we would go through Metronic, was how much attention will the Metronic folks give this product? Because they have a set of portfolio of hard valve products. And, you know, we were concerned about cannibalization of our product, of their product. And that there, there, was, there would potentially be tension between, again, the various product groups, given, you know, the, 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 the similarity between the products. And again, between the 200,000 products, I'm assuming you have, you know, some products which are similar and some of them are cannibalizing other products. And, you know, I'm curious, how do you manage that? Well, uh, on the distribution business, there's huge tension. Because on the one hand, as an example, this is public information. I'm not showing a secret. We're exclusive in the United States and Australia and New Zealand, I believe, with Colgate. Right. But we also work with P&G. We work with Butler. We represent uh, GlaxoSmithKline and their oral surgery products. We sell uh, the Listerine product. Uh, uh, we sell all of these things. So it's a careful balance. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, you can say whatever you want. What counts the results? And um, there's got to be trust. I think uh, our suppliers trust that we're going to do the right thing. Never without tension, because I've never met a supplier that says, wow, you're doing so well, you're selling too much of my product. It's never enough. Um, there's always debate. Did we put the right product on the website when you enter? In our case, we still have a lot of catalogs. Who goes on the front page, of the, uh, who goes on the front cover of the catalog, the inside cover, the back of the cover? So there's plenty of tension. And we have to manage that through. And then, of course, we own businesses, as I said, the specialty businesses. Some of those products are actually competing with our suppliers' products that they may not sell through us or they may sell through us. And our, our entrepreneurial partners say, well, why are you pushing their products and not exclusively ours? So this is a lot of tension. And I would say dealing with this tension is probably one of our core competency. I'm not aware of too many distributors uh, uh, that are actually having these kinds of complex uh, partnerships. But at the end of the day, we've created a huge amount of shareholder value because there is no way that we would have enough knowledge or management capability to go into that many different areas. You need partners to do that. There's no way we could open up, for example, in Israel, selling dental products without a partner. We can try, but, and we can hire a manager, but we won't succeed, at least in, in our world. So we have a partner in Israel. It's been our partner for 20 years on distribution. So partnerships are critical, yet they bring tension, they conflict with non-partners, and the product lines even amongst partners conflict. So this is, uh, if you have trust, you can get it done. You have to be honest that there's going to be conflicts. And we're very clear as we enter into any relationship with either big suppliers or uh, smaller entrepreneurs that there's going to likely be a conflict along the road. Excellent, amazing. So it's, it's in the end of the day, it's relationship and it's about people. And we're gonna, yeah. we're gonna come back to, to you know, people and leadership, especially in the current circumstances and current time. But, but before we do that, I'm, I'm really curious to hear a little bit about the transition that Henry Schein did. And, and you know, you've been moving into and, and selling software products and software platforms as well as services. And, um, and again, not to insult anybody, but you know, many of your products I would call, call them you know, simple, I don't want to say commodity product, but very simple product. And suddenly you guys are becoming extremely innovative, acquiring companies and moving into, you know, very sophisticated software products. And I'm, I'm curious, how did you make this, this transition? Well, first of all, not easy. Second of all, serendipity. No one plans to put what we put together. It would be crazy. So what happened is you're talking about software and this is the way these things happen is um, we started distributing in the early 90s a package of practice management software from a fellow who was a senior executive at IBM and he said I believe in PCs he left IBM and started this package believe it or not uh, in about four or five years we'd sold 10,000 of these systems it was a handshake he bumps into me on the floor of the American Dental Association meeting in Boston I'll never forget this and he says, Stan, thank you for the good job you've done for us. 
we're selling the business. He says, you can bid for the business if you want. I don't think you're going to want to because the price is going to be high. So a couple of lessons out of that. First of all, we don't enter into these kinds of agreements anymore without having a contract. But uh, the bottom line is we bought the business uh, and we grew it. It was a dust system. The challenge is, here comes Windows. So we didn't know how to bring Windows software to market. We spent a ton of money and the thing didn't work. I mean, it's silly to think about it now, but in the, uh, I think it was the late 80s, early 90s, uh, that was a big challenge. So we went off to uh, Utah to find the, the best player in the software business, in Windows. Larry Gibson was his name. And his first reaction is, I can't work with a cotton ball salesman company. You guys sell cotton balls. I'm into high tech. <laughs> a lot, a lot, a lot of meetings and discussions. And finally, we were a public company. In those days, pooling of interest was possible. We mer oh, it was logical. We merged our company. He became Michelle and Henry Shine. That was the beginning of our practice solutions business, our software business. He did us a great favor. He took over our screwed up uh, um, Windows system and he put it on his platform. First thing he said to me, though, very hard for a public company uh, to accept, he said, you know, we have a great window system. You want your system and your brand to stay. We had easy dental and he had Dentrix. You've got to put it on our platform. And at that time he said to me, it's going to cost you $3 million. Where we young public companies, $3 million. He says, well, the only way I'll do this deal is if you agree to put your system, the one you developed on our platform, made a lot of sense. Two brands, Slightly different, but on one platform. Very expensive, we got that done. We never have done that if we were a pure distribution company. Never even thought of it. But he helped us develop it. So fast forward, that business grew very well. Then what happened is demand generation software became important. You know, the software, in its simplest form, it's a reminder that goes out. A reminder, it used to be a card, then a message. But now it's all sorts of sophisticated stuff. You go to the web, you look for implants, a message pops up and says, this, doc, this dentist does this kind of work. We didn't know anything, we knew about it, but we were not good at it. So there's a company called, by the name of Internet Brands. Internet Brands is a big player in uh, B2B business. They, I think, were one of the first, if not the first, in putting an internet platform together to buy an automobile on the internet. Uh, they uh, own WebMD. So what we did is we agreed to merge our businesses the largest business in uh, practice management software, the largest business in electronic medical records with the largest player in demand generation software. We put it together. They are KKR owned business, <coughs> not one where <coughs> the business has to be sold regularly because it's a feeder type business uh, where KKR has a more or less long-term investment and they buy, they put different portfolio businesses into their uh, uh, into this, this business and then they develop them and they sell them. But we put that together. None of this is easy, but because you've got partners and you've got different interests, private equity, public company has different interests. Having said that, there's no way they would have gotten the benefits of the installed base. And there's no way that Henry Shine would have been able to manage through our core business capabilities, this kind of a, a, a business. So this is the way we operate, and uh, it's part of our core competency. Incredible, and, and it sounds like you know part of your growth has been you know through acquisitions of, of companies. And again, if I have my my st stats correct, I think you've acquired more than two hundred companies in the last uh, thirty years. So, so you've gained quite a lot of experience. You know, when, when my company was acquired, I remember I had a, a discussion with Omar Ishrak, which I know is a dear friend of yours. I know him very well. Chairman of, of Medtronic, and by the way, he did send his regards. I told him I'll be talking to you, and I think he said that you guys are actually meeting next week or last week. But uh, we were on a, a Zoom last week. He, he gave the most remarkable presentation last week. He, he's just an amazing individual. Well, that's what he said about you as well. But in any event, you know, he told me that you know when he acquired my company, he said, you know, it's it's so important, and he said, you know, I never know. It's like flipping a coin which acquisition is going to be successful and which won't be successful. It's so important, not only to ensure there's a product fit, but also to make sure there's a cultural fit 
between the companies and you know part of the metrodic intent was not only to acquire the product but also to bring on board the team so so i'm i'm just curious you know it's a remarkable experience to acquire 200 companies but what have you learned over the years through those uh, acquisitions so i don't know the exact number at some point we'll get an mba to do a study but i bet at least a third of the show held the value we've created over the years has been through joint ventures in one way or another. Either we have a majority interest we consolidate or we have a minority in its investment. By the way, when we have the majority interest to consolidate, we don't talk to potential partners about we need the majority so we can vote at board meetings and control because I think, as you know this, the first time you vote uh, at a board meeting with a partner, the partnership's over. So... Uh, we have built a lot of shareholder value working with partners. It is very difficult. Let me just say one thing. From our point of view, we have a team that does the due diligence, a team that does the integration. All of that's important. But the most important due diligence is on the people to ensure that you're aligned. And we've had very few failures. We had one, a, a bad one in the uh, mid-90s, a brilliant leader created a great company, but had different values to us. So that thing didn't work out. And from that point on, it's over 20 years ago, 25 years ago, um, we have focused heavily in the due diligence period. I mean, you can call it due diligence, but it's the getting to know period on whether we're going to align on values. And um, it doesn't work out with everyone. A lot of deals are created because of the values. We haven't gotten past that. But remember, we do essentially what you do, except we don't lead. We take a company from a particular point to another point. We build on it. But it's a strategic investment for us, and we want to stay permanently. I guess if I had to say, if I could explain, when we're courting somebody to do one of these joint ventures, they always say, well, private equity will give me more money. We'll say, yes, they will, but you're going to be seeking a new partner four to five to six years from now. You will be with us for as long as you want. And you can sell your interest to us, or you can sell a part of it, but you can stay and you can continue to grow. How that all manages is really a core competency of ours and is very important. Not easy, because of course we bring managers on board. We can never grow enough talent internally, so we bring managers on board from large companies. Many of them just don't have the patience for this and don't understand it. They say, well, I can get a more competent manager to do something. I said, well, you can do that. You win the war, but you lose the peace. Not easy. Right. right. No, I can't, I can't agree with you more. It's all about the people, you know, uh, I think our industry, the venture capital industry, our job is really to hunt for talent. You know, in the end of the day, we're headhunters. But I think Correct. your job is probably yeah. a little bit, more, your job is probably a little bit more challenging because, you know, we hunt for talent. We find the talent. We invest in that talent. We allow the company to grow. And when you come in and, and sign up for a distributor agreement with them, you know, they might already want to cash out. So how do you keep the talent in the company? Ah, very good point. First of all, um, I would say, I have to think about 90% of the deals we do, we do not buy 100%. Even with some of the private equity deals, we are partnering with, an existing shareholder, and an entrepreneur. <coughs> Very often it's the same. But I'm thinking about, uh, in its purest sense, we uh, entered into a, a joint venture with HealthPoint Partners was the name, I think it's on the private equity at the time, and uh, BioRisons. BioRisons is a great implant company. They try to take them public, it wasn't the right time. They try to sell them at a high price. No one would pay the price that they were looking. And we said, okay, sell us 51% of the interest. Was, in this instance, we wanted to consolidate because it would have been it was part of a plan to build an implant business and would, would materiality. So we said to them, look, we'll pay you an entry price going in, but you still have a huge part of the equity in the game, which you will grow that equity through synergies with us. And we're going to make sure that we're liberal with creating the synergies and you will do well because the bottom line is we wanted to do some additional deals with them and we want other to deal, do de deals with other private equity firms. So if we don't do a good job here with them, 
the world would get up and say, you don't want to work with Shine. And I think we've got a good track record for working with private equity, for example, in building businesses. So in that case, we built the business, did a good job, and I think they got out after five years. We have another example in, uh, with Oak Hill in the animal health field, which was supposed to be a five-year deal. The, thing, the synergies came so quickly, and after 18 months, they came to us and said, we know we can't put the stock, will you let us put the stock? I said, sure, because we got a good deal, they got a good deal. We knew the business, we were buying a business with the engine running, so we didn't have to do too much due diligence, we had confidence in the team. So that's sort of one area. The other area is with entrepreneurs. So entrepreneurs have several ways of getting cash. Family, banks, they can come to venture or private equity firms, or in rare instances, they can partner with large companies. We give them everything they want from a capital point of view. We give them guidance on management, adding CFOs and whatever you, know, you guys do. And uh, they have the ability to stay on. And they can sell equity whenever they want. So this works from that point of view. But what's important is we need to understand their temperament going in. And we have to explain to them a couple of things. First of all, you can't just make decisions anymore on your own. You have to work with us. They don't quite always realize that the first time they go for private equity, they learn that lesson quickly, but they learn it. But the big thing we have to explain to them is you're part of a public company that is SEC compliant. So there, you need budgets. We have risks and opportunities every month. They hate it. And we say to them, well, if you do the right thing, you want to do the right thing, go and hire yourself a professional CFO. Well, I'm not going to pay that money. Get it up front. Put that in. That person will deal with us and work with you. But you, you don't want our people calling you all day long on uh, R&Os and did you get this insurance certificate? Uh, uh, you just entered into a new lease. You never filled the form out in compliance with our corporate requirements. So what we say to them, you got to understand that you're going to have to partner. But of course, they eventually understand they're going to do that private equity anyway. But you're part of a U.S. public company and there's a lot of compliance. And we've got to make sure we understand that going in. And then... What you need to know is if you have an idea, you have to be able to sell it a bit. You can't just do it. But that discipline is not so bad. And if we find that all of that works and people are respectful, we can do the deal. And we spend a lot of time talking before and doing a lot of due diligence. And the track record's not bad. We've had a couple of failures, as I said, but generally people want to stay in. And we have, uh, I would say, 35 deals with people have been in for more than 10 years uh, in Australia, we have a partnership that's, I think, over 20 years. Amazing, amazing. You know, Stanley, we've been conducting a due diligence process on a, uh, on a dental company, or def dental software platform company. And, uh, you know, I won't mention their name, but it, we've, uh, we've heard through the great vines that, that Henry Schein and you specifically uh, have been looking at this company as well. And this is a very early stage company. They've just kind of launched the product. So I'm curious, I mean, first of all, you know, I admire you for getting involved in a small little startup company, which was just founded. But I'm curious, if I am an entrepreneur in Israel, who do I call? How do I make connections, uh, the right connections with Henry Schein? I'm sure you can't afford looking at all startup companies. And I'm sure a lot of people are knocking on your doors. Yeah, so we have an innovation group uh, led by Dr. Uh, Dr. Bruce Lieberthal out of Boston. He has a couple of people working with him and he works with uh, our business development team. Um, and he screens these opportunities. Having said that, I think on the, the kind of company you just described, it's not a terrible thing for that company to work with you and then come to us. Because we don't invest in R&D per se. Of course, in our implant business, we have an R&D budget. But generally, we do not invest in the early stage and take P&L write-offs. Okay. Uh, very rarely. So it's very... The, the, the best way to take an early stage company and work with us is for the entrepreneur to work with you. Then when you have something, and we'll help you get there, you have a distribution agreement with us. And then when the thing starts turning profitable... We have a right to execute on the acquisition or 
uh, a percent of the acquisition. But from a P&L point of view, we're not the right company to do what you would do better than us, which is to fund the, the loss period. I'm not gonna say we've never done that. We just bought a company in the UK, a small software company. It was our first uh, post COVID. And essentially it was equivalent to buying software rather than a business. They, had, they have some customers, thousand customers or something, but losing money. Uh, but that's a little different and it's very unusual for us. Understood, understood. So, so, and, and could you, could you uh, kind of call out a number of uh, areas that you're interested in? I mean, we talked about software. What about, uh, you know, 3D uh, manufacturing? What about robotics? What are some of the areas that, uh, you know, we have many entrepreneurs uh, participating right. in this session today. What are the areas that are interesting you? What do you see, you know, 10 years from today being, being areas that, that would be innovative and, and interesting? Right. So here's the story. I did not get through high school physics. So I'm not the right person to ask. Uh, I have a list they gave me here to, uh, in my notes. I can find it. But the bottom line is um, anything that helps a dentist, a physician, a dental laboratory operate a more efficient practice that can provide better clinical care. We are not company, a company to bring out bleeding edge technology. Um, I would say generally, there are exceptions, that we're more in the 80% of the bell curve. When there's somewhat of an adoption, we are there. So uh, I'm not going to say we were, I think, the first to, to offer electronic uh, medical records for dentists. We certainly were the first to offer an internet ordering platform, in fact, an intranet platform those kinds of things uh, we, we have done. Um, but if somebody has an idea relative to helping practitioners operate a more efficient practice that they can provide, provide better clinical care, we would be a good place to start. Um, we may say it's not for us yet. Go and find private equity, go and find a venture or work with one of our suppliers. We have done that many times. We've sent people with ideas to give a private equity to one of our suppliers to develop the product under a supplier brand or one of our own portfolio companies that could do that. And then we distribute. Uh, there's no one answer to this, but the product needs are really anything that could help the practitioner. So remember, if it's a home care product, it's unlikely to be for us today. If it's something that the physician can use in the home, and prescribe, and the physician can bill? Yes, of course. Uh, it's unlikely if it's a pure acute care product that will be for us. If it goes from acute care to the alternate care site, yes. But I'll be quick to say, we do have arrangements with companies that focus on the acute care side, and we can partner. Our interest is the product for the office-based setting, or for the urgy center, for the ambulatory surgical center. That's our interest. Um, and, and, and it's got to be already relatively accepted. It does, again, it doesn't matter, I mean that we have in our implant business, we've been the first to introduce new technology there in endodontics, uh, but we were not the first to introduce an aligner. Uh, we have our own aligner now, and, and uh, uh, that aligner is pretty successful. We didn't invent the technology, somebody else did. We're selling it, but we do, are developing some software, or we have, to connect that aligner to the practice management software. But anything in that sphere would be of interest to us. And if you're not sure if it has of interest, send an email to us. The one thing I can assure you, you'll get a response quickly. Excellent, outstanding. So, you know, Stanley, this has been a really interesting and, and, and a fascinating discussion. We only have about 10 minutes left and I'd love to talk a little bit about, about leadership and, and specifically about your leadership, uh, which I think is, is very unique. You know, not only did Henry Schein, is Henry Schein a very successful company, a $10 billion company, but it's been a Fortune World most admired company for 17 years. And I'm curious, what, what makes Henry Schein so unique on the ethical and social part? And how does it, how does the company, the fact that you are so ethically and socially driven, how does it make the company stronger financially? Well, uh, first of all, 
the concept of a, what we call a higher ambitions company, company with purpose. This has been written up in the last few years. I would say in the last few years, uh, our friends from BlackRock and a couple of others said it was important. But at Henry Schein, we've been practicing this for years. Um, when I meet with our management, they say, what makes a company successful? I say, well, uh, if you can run a summer camp and get everyone engaged, you'll be successful. Whether it's from our portfolio companies, suppliers, or our team. And I believe that at the end of the day, people want to be engaged with companies that make a difference in the world. By the way, it may, there may have been a desire in, um, say, five to ten years ago, but now, if you want to get the best talent, you better be prepared uh, to attract millennials through having a purpose. So, purpose requires authenticity. You can't, there's, uh, I live in Manhattan, there's a particular company, I don't want to mention the name, that has a sustainability program and it's pasted all over their ground floor in their building. I don't believe that the leadership of that company really is involved in sustainability. They hired a consulting firm to put a sustainability program together. I think you've got to care about the world. You've got to care about your suppliers, your team, your customers. And if you do that right, I think you will get a good return on investment. In fact, there's a Harvard study that shows that companies that engage with their team and are socially responsible have a four times greater return on investment. And um, I believe private equity firms can do the same. You will attract, I think, better management if it is viewed that you're a socially responsible company. And uh, you can't do that through simply hiring a public relations firm to say we're a socially responsible company. It's got to be in the fiber of the business. Um, I can't give you a better answer than that. No, and, and you know, we can't agree with you more. We, we've, we've um, in the last year or so, we've uh, added an officer into Pitango, which is responsible for impact and he's helping us develop uh, various metrics and for the various companies. Because again, we, we understand that uh, if you are a ethical company, um, and socially driven, we, we believe that this will, will drive much stronger companies on the financial side as well. Um, you know, on that point, Guy, um, about three years ago, four years ago, I went to see an investor. And on the, sitting in the back, you know, one of these roadshow things, just uh, sitting in the back of the room, I said, who are those people? They are from uh, the ESG group that we just established. And I said, what are they doing? Three or four years ago is what they're doing. They've come out of the closet. The environmental, sustainability, uh, and governance people are key now. And I think it's going to be important. And as if I were in your world, as I develop companies, I put this into the culture right away because I think the exit strategy will be at a higher valuation. I agree. And, and, and you know, Stanley, I'm, I'm curious because, you know, we are going through a, a really very interesting crisis and being a, such a strong healthcare company, um, I'm wondering, and, and not only a strong healthcare company, but also a very ethical company. I'm wondering how do you how do you manage supply and demand between various countries or various regions right now in the United States that are fighting for for, for products? I mean, some of those products, you know, might be ventilators. How do you prioritize, you know, between the various regions given the current uh, circumstances? Well, going into this year, I thought that. I, in particular, would be able to have a very easy year and our team. Business was good. Cash flow was good. Full of ideas, projects. And then COVID hit. Of course, COVID had its enormous implications on society individually. And I'm personally been in my apartment in Manhattan for six months. I just visit family, close family, grant. That's it. So there's all of that. But the enormous impact of PPE on our company was unbelievable for another day. Uh, yeah, we had to make choices. Who do we give product for? Now, we did get guidance. We're on the, in the US on the uh, White House uh, FEMA task force, so we get guidance. 
But in the end, decisions have to be made. And in April, and yeah, just in April, end of March, April, sitting here in my apartment, we had to decide, are we gonna send the products to one hospital? That's not really our customer down the road. Another one uptown, downtown, they were not really our customers because we don't really service hospitals that some outpatient clinics, but they were largely closed. So there were a lot of moral decisions that had to be made. Um, governments were not helpful. Certain governments shut down. Other governments, and you'd be surprised to know who, uh, actually wouldn't allow products to be exported for a while. Within the EU, there were countries that stopped that. It was a very, very challenging point of time. And at the end of the day, you have to have your values decide. Uh, I will tell you that I got internally with a lot of criticism from some of our salespeople. Uh, and for a month, we didn't prioritize dentistry. And uh, dentists wanted product just to stockpile it. We, stock, we focused on uh, those that were in the hot spots, And we focused on certain countries. Not easy. But in the end, if you make the right decisions and go on the high, high road, you will, <coughs> I think, have uh, long-term benefits for the company and the management. Right, right. And, and, and standing, we only have a few more minutes left and I have you know, plenty of extra questions, but I do have to ask you, you know, how do you see this, the, the healthcare industry changing in light of, of COVID-19? I mean, you know, we all are speculating that by end of next year, obviously, hopefully there'll be a vaccination available, but do, do you see this industry changing um, dramatically because of this crisis? Um, I happened to have a call yesterday with one of our manufacturers. I want to mention the name, but a key manufacturer in, of medical, actually they make dental, some dental products as well, uh, and devices. And the chair of the board told me yesterday, it's a family business, that uh, in her view, digitalization moved extremely fast. So they are now thinking in their business, what is the implications of telemedicine? Right. Now, we, are, we have a teledentistry product as well. We offer a telemedicine product as well. Uh, this is going to be a significant change. And there'll be opportunities. I, sitting here, I can't imagine how it will be done, but I'm sure that you may even be talking to entrepreneurs where people at home can have a device that the doctor can read. And so I, I think uh, the whole world of telemedicine, of digitalization, will be profoundly different now than ever before. And uh, in addition, the whole world of infection control. You're asking for areas to invest in. Infection control, sepsis control, by companies that understand science and that are regulatorily compliant not only with FDA, but if EPA, those areas are going to be huge opportunities. Uh, of course, the biggest change I think that will be impacting business in general will be the notion that the business of business is no longer business, purely business. Businesses will be expected to view society in the decision plans going forward, not as an elective, but a requirement. Public-private partnerships will be key critical. I'm sure in Israel as well, a lot of the progress was made through working between the private sector, universities, and the government. So definitely exciting times for, for the healthcare industry. Uh, you know, we're very obviously excited about uh, innovation over here in Israel and the partnership that we've been developing um, with the health tech fund uh, in Pitango with some of our portfolio companies. I have to say we're also very excited about, uh, you know, Israel signing two new uh, peace treaties today. Uh, so those are exciting news and I think there's, there's a bright future ahead of us. Um, Stanley, this was a remarkable uh, um, session. Really, I enjoyed it personally very much. Uh, we are having a second session on the 13th of October. Uh, if you do have time, please join us. We'll be hosting uh, Sanjay, Senior VP at Optum, talking about AI and anal analytics. Um, so I'm sure that uh, would be interesting for, for some of the folks of Henry Schein. And again, Stanley, most importantly, thank you very much for the friendship and, and thank you very much for all of those, uh, for those wisdom. Uh, we very much enjoyed it. So thank you, Guy. Kemi, if you're on the line, I hope to see you in Davos in the, in the early part of summer next year. I'm told there'll be a meeting. And uh, uh, on the India Business Forum, Aron, 
I, I hope we'll be able to get together. I believe we have a virtual meeting coming up, but I'm optimistic that we will have a vaccine, but it doesn't end with a vaccine. Uh, PPE and infection control is going to be required now going forward. And I think uh, sometime in 2021, we'll start having meetings again. Excellent. We, we hope so. And I see Hemi, both Hemi and Aaron are online, and I'm sure they're sending uh, you the best of wishes. And again, uh, happy uh, new year, Stanley. For, yes, thank you. And thank you very much again for, for this wonderful session. Have a great thank day. Bye-bye. Don't forget us when you have new products. <laughs> we won't. Thank you very much.